We're going to talk about the, the rotator cuff problems. And then we're going to just mention adhesive capsulitis. We see that in women particularly. And a little bit of Arthur and AC joint issues. So this is the spectrum uh, of rotator cuff problems. We start with tendonitis. Those changes that we talked about, the blood supply diminishes, the tendon gets a little weaker. Uh, the same thing that Ed could do when he was 50, he can't do now when he's 70 because his tendon is just a little weaker. It just can't withstand the stresses. I'll give you my example. I'm uh, 54 years young and I play a lot of ball and I think I hurt my shoulder a couple times in college. I was on the offensive line, all this pass blocking stuff and my shoulder got a little loose but I did fine and it was a little loose and every once in a while it'd feel a little wobbly. And then I turned about 45 and I noticed I was at a, a water park one day and I was trying to impress my wife. I said, let me, I'll show you I can hang by the monkey bars. And I felt something grab and eh, I felt a little strained. And then I got better. And then a couple years later, it started hurting. So what I think happened was I, I had an already loose shoulder and then I made it a little looser. And my rotator cuff in time just failed to keep it contained. See, rotator cuff also keeps your shoulder stable. So things I could do when I'm 45, I can't do on 50. I can't, I have trouble doing this. I get pain in the back. I got a little arthur, I'm sure. And uh, a lot of docs don't want to get x-rays, like physician heal thyself. I don't want to get an x-ray. I don't want to look at it. It's not going to change. I'm not going to get an operation, so don't look at it. So cuffs start at partial thickness tears, then they go to full thickness in time. And these are the four muscles that we talked about. This is the supraspinatus, the subscapularis, infraspinatus, teres minor. And most of the stuff we see goes on in this top muscle here. This is one that gets most of the stress. And God gave us a little bursa here, a little fluid-filled sac that gets inflamed that extends all the way down to here. I think when the bursa gets inflamed, it refers pain down. And I think that's one of the reasons why patients complain of pain here. So this is the most commonly involved tendon, the supraspinatus. 90% of the cuffs that I see involve this tendon. And we think that's increased demand of activity and we're talking about something called impingement. And when you raise your arm, you may get pain because that tendon is sandwiched between two bones. Anyone out there heard the term impingement? Many things impinge. But when we say as a shoulder surgeon, impingement, we think of rotator cuff impingement. There are other examples of impingement. You could have cervical impingement, pinging a nerve root. Um, you know, sometimes you put a total hip in and it impinges on the socket. So, but most of, you say impingement to an orthopedic surgeon, most of the time they'll think shoulder. That's probably what they meant. Um, so this impingement is basically when God made the shoulder, this is the acromion, this is the tuberosity, this rotator cuff is sandwiched between the two, and it can get pinched in time with age. And one of the reasons it happens as we get older is because one of the functions of the cuff is it actually pulls the humeral head down away from this bone. As it gets weaker, the humor head rides up and pinches against uh, that acromion bone. And so it's a vicious cycle. I think it's not just in the bone. I think it's just the cuff weakness that causes this whole process. And we as surgeons, when they grow all heroes, we go in and shave the bone off, when the, really the biggest problem was, I think, the tendon circulation to start with. So some people were born with a uh, shoulder blade that has a hook to it. We call this an acromion bone. Some people have a very narrow outlet, we call it. And some people, by virtue of their posture, uh, can also narrow that outlet. I want you all to sit in your chairs right now. I want you to hunch your shoulders forward right now. Everyone do this. I want you to raise your right hand forward as far as you can. Just put your shoulders hunched forward. All right. Now I want you to put your arm down. I want you, my father's a Marine, I want you everybody to put their shoulders back, chin in, I want you to raise your arm again. As my father would say, any questions? <laughs> what you've just done is you've gotten your shoulder blade out of the way of your, of your rotator cuff. That's called non-outlet impingement. So poor posture can also worsen impingement. There are many, many, many people who don't need an operation, they just need to see a good therapist, like my friend TJ Andich in the back, and work on their shoulder blade the shoulder blade back out of the way. My father was a Marine, and I, didn't, I never understood this. Any, any veterans in the audience? Well, I, I got to tell you, the reason I was late, guess where I was today, guys? The VA. I, I volunteered one day a month to operate on veterans' shoulders, and it's been a wonderful experience. And um, 
uh, those guys really walk around with a lot of stuff and they never complain. So I have the blessing going there one day a month. Actually, they pay me. I didn't know that, but I go there one day a month. And you'd be surprised what I see there. Um, so make a long story short, my father was a Marine. He always had me stand up straight. But you know, there's good science behind good posture. Not only does it help your neck, but also gets your shoulder blade away from your rotator cuff. So one of the best things you can do if you have a shoulder problem is try this. Just throughout the day, try to pinch your shoulder blades together just to get them um, retracted, we call it. If you want to check if your posture is good, as you stand, your hand should be along the shafts of your femur bones. If they're anterior, then you're a little too slouched. That's a good rule of thumb. All right. Look at this fellow here. That's a protracted scapula. And he doesn't need an operation. He needs a good uh, therapist. Right? So we talk about this posture when we say protraction. It really is a nice fancy word for just internal rotation of the scapula, bringing the scapula bone closer to the rotator cuff. And uh, again, night pain, pain on the shoulder, overhead, radiation to that deltoid tuberosity. And now I'll look at all these tests. Uh, don't, don't bore yourself with the details here, but one of these we look for is we call posture capsule tightness. If I have a ball and socket and it's cloaked in a capsule, if I make the back really tight, what's that going to do to the socket? It's going to push it forward. So if the back of your shoulder is tight, if you forward flex your arm, you're literally bringing that humerus bone against the acromion. So that also can cause impingement just by being stiff in the back. Now, why would you get stiff in the back? Well, if your shoulder hurts, you don't want to reach in the back, get stiff. If you have diabetes, everything gets stiff. If you have thyroid, anyone in the audience have a thyroid issue? Now, if someone comes in the office with a stiff shoulder, the first two questions they ask are, any history of diabetes in the family and have they had a thyroid problem? And we don't know why, but we also think that thyroid issues are associated with inflammation. So uh, a stiff shoulder, very, very commonly associated with thyroid dysfunction. And I would bet, I've seen so many people come to me with maybe the incidental rotator cuff in the MRI for this young lady here with the thyroid issue, and she's stiff. Does she, need to get her, does she need to get her cuff fixed? No, she needs to see a good therapist to get her motion back, which is the principal pain generator. Remember that 60% rule, or 50%. If you're over 60, about 50% of you will have a rotator cuff tear and not know it. So just because you have a rotator cuff tear doesn't mean you need an operation. Pain. That's ascribed to that cuff. So this is a good way we measure posture capsule tightness. So if this young lady here has a thyroid issue and she's tight in the back, we put her on a stretching program, just like this. This is called capsular constraint. Basically, this is a picture showing that if the back is tight, it, as the person rotates their arm, particularly this way, forward, it'll push the humeral head. It's a reciprocal motion, we call it. This is called the impingement test. So if someone has an, uh, an activated cuff injury, if we just bring their arm up like this, and then their cuff hits that acromion bone, it usually elicits pain. This is called the near test. So if that impingement test, and maybe your doctor has done this, if they give you a little Novocaine into the, into the bursa, come back in five minutes if it's better, usually, and this is a little controversial, but usually it means that your rotator cuff's the problem. I use a lot of injections because, again, Mother Nature plays tricks on us. If it's really, you don't know if it's the neck or the shoulder, inject the shoulder. If you have someone uh, who has, I do a lot of hip arthroscopy. If you have someone who has groin pain and you don't know if it's their back, what's the logical thing to do? Inject their hip joint. So uh, this is the near test. And again, this is the, the supraspinatus tendons where the tears usually start. And this test I love because this is one that shows a very, very small cuff tear if it's present. This is called the Whipple test, named after Dr. Whipple. And if someone brings their arm in front of their chest right here, and if they resist downward promotion, if they're really weak, they may have a small undersurface cuff tear. Small. Everyone who comes in the office, uh, and I don't believe in radiation therapy, so if I have someone with a very, very obvious exam, obvious history, they have decent motion, I send them to the therapist, like TJ, and they get better. I don't like x-rays unless they're going to change things. Even a simple shoulder x-ray for a woman can give you a little bit of breast scatter, OK? OK, so I get MRI if I'm, I'm uncertain uh, and if something's a red flag. So here's an MRI. You'll see like these little small tears just right 
here. That's a small tear. Now, I just came from the VA, and I, I operated on a veteran. This young lady was only 35 years old, and you looked at her and holding it, said, what is she doing with this rotator cuff tear? Her MRI was, for, was just like this, and I told the residents that, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if we're going to find much here. And she was basically disabled. Like, I, I'm dying. Put the scope in, and she had about a centimeter tear. Now, why at 35 she has symptoms, whereas most of these tears are asymptomatic? I think it's activity. She has a higher demand on her shoulder. But I was really unimpressed with the size of her tear, and I was impressed with her symptoms. I think the difference is she's very active. In time, this tendon will degenerate, and in many cases become fatty, and we call it fatty degeneration, and we're actually doing some studies, I don't know if in our lab, uh, but we have probably one of the world's greatest shoulder researchers, Dr. Soslowski, in our lab at downtown, and looking at ways how to slow down this fatty atrophy process. But some studies indicate it may take up to two years. And you're left with that situation where you get in there and you finally made a decision to operate and the tissue is like Kleenex. That's, that's, that's what I struggle with sometimes because uh, I, I try to watch the patients carefully. Um, if they come in and they're already degenerative and, and they're symptomatic, I do tend to say we ought to fix this now because we do know that fixing it will arrest atrophy. It will not reverse it. It will arrest it in the best scenario. So uh, this, is a, this is a big tear. Now, if this person came in and they were active and they were symptomatic, this is the one I probably would uh, consider fixing. But uh, I saw a, um, but an 80-year-old lady to, uh, this week who had a rather large tear. But when I talked to her closely, she had symptoms for a long time that just got worse. So I think she had an acute on chronic tear. So I injected her, put her, gave her some rehab. I said, let's see you in a month. Let's see how you're doing. If she comes back miserable, that to me says that this extension of the tear is significant biomechanically probably needs to be addressed. Now here's the unanswered question. How do we figure out which tears do go into fatty infiltration? Well, we know the larger ones do, but uh, there's some smaller ones that go on to degeneration too. We, now that's the unanswered question that no one really knows to my, to my satisfaction. So, um, so if you have an early tendon disease, we put you on a strengthening program. And this is one that I love. This, is the, this gets the, the workhorse of the shoulders, a muscle called the infraspinatus. And I try to work on this muscle most importantly because I think that's the one that gives you the best bang for the buck. Now, this is a subtle scapular problem. Look at this asymmetry. See this one, see this one shoulder blade, how it's up and out? Mm -hmm. That shoulder blade needs to be addressed with rehab. This is a posterior capsule stretch for those of you that are stiff. This is a great exercise for loosening up the shoulder capsule. So the young lady said about stretching. Well, before activities, maybe not, but, but certainly for a stiff shoulder, we send people to people like TJ all the time to stretch their shoulder several times a day. So we don't know if it in interferes with injury, but we do know that it does make their shoulder feel better in terms of daily living. So there's a little difference in terms of when to stretch. So for, and here's one I love, it's called the low row, where we actually get a, a strength in one of the muscles that actually keeps your shoulder blades retracted. Got a cute story, I have a um, twin brother, identical twin, and a pre, make a preamble to the story that there's this one stretch that we use and anyone old enough to remember the expression, hey big boy, anyone recognize that? She's shaking her head, well, apparently like in the 50s that was a come online for a girl, hey big boy. So the stretch is you put your hands in your back pocket and you try to bring your, sh your elbows together. So I'm at my dad's bar in Wilmington, Delaware and I'm sitting there minding my own business and this beautiful blonde comes up to me and basically does a Hey, big boy. I'm like, what's up with this? Turns out she was dating my twin brother. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I ain't Mike, I'm John. She was like, oh! <laughs> but she did the hey, big boy to me, so. <clears throat> Those of you, just, just try, put your hands in your back pockets and bring your elbows together. It's a nice little stretch. It stretches a muscle called the pectoralis minor, which has been shown to be tight in people with chronic shoulder pain. Back pockets, hey, big boy, stick your chest out, bring your elbows in. Several times a day, try that stretch. It'll stretch a muscle uh, called the pectoralis minor, which has been shown to increase protraction. So, why are we here tonight? Who needs an operation? Well, fewer people than you think. I like to send my patients to someone I trust, a therapist like Dr. An or Mr. Andich here, or some of the therapists we have at Good Shepherd. They trust, they know they're working. If they come back in three months and they're still miserable, I start talking surgery. 
if you have a full thickness tear and someone is really active who needs their arm for work, you know, cement, labor, I know they're going to have problems, then I start talking surgery. And if there's two tendons involved, I start mentioning the, the subject. Massive tears. They're over five centimeters in width. They get, they get atrophic commonly. And what, is in, what does it mean by unstable force couple? They've lost so much mechanical advantage that they can't contain the humerus. So when your deltoid fires, the humerus goes up, and they've lost all sense of a fulcrum in their arm. So if I have someone in the office that does this, that means that they really have a big tear, and they probably need to get it fixed. So if they don't have a shrug, and they have any measurable abduction, I can help you. So why should we fix these? Well, I think that if you take the arthroscope and try to at least do a partial repair, you can get someone significant relief and maybe slow down this process of wear and tear. And this is something called a reverse prosthesis. And I don't hate this device. I've done this operation, but it is a big, big hit. Big hit to your shoulder. Basically what we do, uh, if someone has a big cuff tear, chop off the head, put this we call glenosphere on the socket. And what this does, those of you that have any mechanical background, the center rotation is now gone from here to here. That means that the lever arm for the deltoid is now increased. So it actually, basically, this big honker prosthesis makes your deltoid work a little better. The problem with this operation is, once you've done this, you can't go back. Complication rate in this operation is as high in some series as 68%. Do I do this? I would uh, if I really was at the, at the back end of the wall. But I think my bias is many people haven't taken the time to learn the requisite arthroscopic skills to do a partial repair. That's my bias. I'm an arthroscopist. That's how I feel. But I believe that's uh, really the way to best treatment for patients long term. Because the arthroscopic treatment doesn't burn any bridges. And you may hit a home run. Sometimes you don't. And this is the end result of an untreated large cuff tear. Uh, so I love the arthroscope because I think it's God's gift to shoulder surgery. You can look a little puncture, look inside, see the cuff. And this is my buddy from Texas. He's a real Texan. He's an engineer, became a doctor, and he took all these mechanical principles, Dr. Burkhart, and applied them to the shoulder joint. And this is a picture of what we call the force couple. And what Dr. Burkhart realizes is that you don't need your whole cuff to get your shoulder work. You only need certain critical parts. If we can fix those critical parts, you can take Aunt Millie, who goes from here to here. And we're gonna, call, we're gonna talk about the principle of a partial repair. If you can fix the business end of the cuff, you can give your patients a lot of increased abduction and pain relief. And Dr. Burkhart recognized that there was this condensation of tissue in the rotator cuff called the cable. And if you got this cable back together again, you can even have a big cuff tear because the cable anchored itself to points on the shoulder that were analogous to a suspension bridge. You know, suspension bridge isn't connected all the way across. There's just two anchor points, right? So it's an interesting analogy. And what he found out was that this is called the infraspinatus. If you get the lower half of this back, you get enough humor head depression that that person has a stable, what we call fulcrum, and can go from not being able to raise their arm to raising their arm. So there's different patterns that we look at and it took an Irish guy to figure this out. Dr. McLaughlin in a 40, 40, 45 looked at rotator cuff tears and said, you know what, maybe this doesn't have to go here, but maybe this comes together side to side. He actually used the biceps tendon as a shoelace and was able to realize that the cuff tear had certain patterns that, if they were recognized, enabled him to fix it under minimal tension. Now, for some reason, we got away from this. And when I trained at, uh, at Penn in the 80s, we were trying to fix this back to that. Well, that's not where it belongs. It goes from here to here. So you have to understand how these cuff tears develop, what's the mobile segment, where it belongs, before you can best treat your patients. Anyone ever, ever go camping and you open the tent door? Well, that tent door goes here. It doesn't go straight across, does it? It goes here. But I think it's all about recognizing the tear patterns and the certain patterns that, that, are, that are, uh, occur and shifting this tissue. And Dr. Burkhardt had the principle called margin conversion. So if you have a big tear like this, if you sew side to side, you actually converge the margin here. So I really think that the side to side sutures are very, very important. So in 
so that you don't have a tension mismatch. Uh, so a small tear like this, like the lady at the VA today, you bring it over. But a big tear like this, you can't expect to get this to that. You have to bring it side to side like this. And you're left with a small crescent tear like that. So I'm a big fan of the arthroscope. I do lateral decubitus position. This is a picture of a patient in the OR. That's how we have him dropped out. And we uh, put the arthroscope in and get a great picture. And these are the steps we use to um, liberate and free up the tear. And what the arthroscope is, uh, we actually had the ability to see the whole shoulder joint. This guy had an infection, and he had this huge gaping cuff tear. And I said, well, you know, I want to approach this side to side. So this little needle that tells me the best angle of approach. And look at this, comes together with minimal tension. So the mobile limb will tell you how it reduces. And uh, I do several recall releases. But the last thing I want to mention tonight is there's a tendon in the front called the subscapularis. There's an old expression in medicine, you haven't seen it, but it's seen you. You haven't seen it, but in other words, if you don't recognize certain things, I think there's an old Hebrew proverb, the eye sees what the mind knows. So if you don't look for subscapularis tears, in the, in the old days, they say, ah, this is just a frayed tissue. That, that's a tear of the subscapularis tendon, the biggest cuff muscle of all. And just in the last five years, we're starting to appreciate this tendon. So one of the reasons I'm so passionate about the arthroscope is these big cuff tears, if we only learn how to fix this tendon, and I'm certainly learning, we can really help our patients with their abduction ability. And this is a small little tear that's retracted. That tissue belongs up in here. Father-in-law, God rest his soul, was a mechanic. And we used to talk about how wonderful it was just working with your hands. You go home and you say, I really fixed not only the car, but somebody's shoulder today. It's a wonderful feeling with these minimally invasive instruments that you can see things and put these. So here's, here's the tendon where it belongs. So he pulled that up and put it back where it belongs. So these subscap tears are very, very big, and they often can be accompanied by a biceps problem because the subscapularis muscle is intimately associated with the, with the biceps tendon. And there's several tests you can use to test its integrity, um, but the arthroscope is much less painful, and you can take these really, really, really big tears like this, whereas 10 years ago, most people would say, oh my gosh, oy vey, call, you know, get, get rid of this, call, put the new shoulder in, you, you can't <coughs> fix this. But if you're patient and know where, it go, know where it belongs and I put a traction stitch in and I play a little detective work and I realize this may come to here and this is what I call no dog ear. When I see no dog ear, it means that I got the tension and I put it back where it belongs. You can take that big tear and fix it like this and the patients will love you. And we do take off a little bit of bone. This is called a chromioplasty. So sometimes if I see a pointed bone like that, I'll take a little burr and just spur it smoothly just so the patient has a little more space. But you don't have to do this in many cases. Recovery probably takes about two years to get fully recovered. But we do keep our patients in a sling for about six weeks. And I've slowed things down. I was having to do a little bit of motion early on. But if it's a big cuff tear like this, I just keep them in a the sling for six weeks and have them just move their elbow and their wrist, sometimes, sometimes even eight weeks. We should just wind down. I just said a word or two about a hescapsulitis, the stiffness in the shoulder here. Um, you'll see females more than males. We don't know exactly why. Maybe something with estrogen. Uh, middle age, global loss of shoulder motion it happens. No reason. We just come in and my shoulder got stiff. I don't know why. Uh, we do know it's linked with high blood sugar and thyroid. And this hyperglycemia thing is very interesting to me research-wise, but when your sugars get higher, uh, those of you that bake cakes, when you look at why the, uh, the dough gets hardened, that's actually a glycation reaction. So you're actually uh, oxidizing these proteins uh, and you're causing cross linkage of your collagen. So uh, um, I think it's related to obesity and the carb connection. <clears throat> and we do know that increased sugar does make Lots of things stiff. There's something called diabetic chiropathy where it actually gets so bad, where the sugars are so bad, their hands get stiff. And yet one of the tests you use is to have them do this, they just can't. Their fingers are so stiff. But one guy about four years ago, he had been to all these therapists and he was like the human cramp like this. And I said, you're diabetic. Yeah, he goes, I said, have you ever had an intra-articular injection? He goes, no. I said, do you mind if I try one? Because he came to me for surgery. He wanted me to release his capsule, which we're seeing right here. I said, you know what? In good faith, I got to give you one injection. 
that I that I'd given that I trust. He said, "Okay." When you know, he came in about a month later. <laughs> now, some of the literature now suggests that maybe short-term relief, but in my experience, 21 years of practice, it's given many many patients long-term relief. And the uh, downside is, if you're diabetic, it will raise your blood sugars for a couple of days. And we know that people who are potentially at risk of getting surgery, there's a couple of rat studies saying it makes the tendon a little weaker temporarily and may actually inhibit the repair. So uh, if someone's really stiff and they don't respond to therapy injections, then we are, the hand is forced. We do what we call a capsule release there. So we just actually take the arthroscope, just cut the capsule, and just, and just do this.